like I explained earlier, completely stay earlier. I will be doing life sciences, and the topic is is DNA. <coughs> Just like we did the drill, you know the drill. We always focus on the exam guideline. Uh, learners, you know we cannot do it in life sciences without the exam guideline. This is our guide. It shows us what to study and what not to, to study. Initially, or beginning of this year, the first topic that you and your teachers looked at was DNA. So, firstly, let us explain or let us... Um, perplex what is meant or what is DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid, we know in our bodies we have two types of nucleic acids, namely DNA as well as RNA. So for today only, I will be focusing on, on DNA. So according to our exam guideline, we first have to revise. We did the same in grade 10. Unfortunately, we skipped the cell in grade 11, and here we are again revising the cell. What is a cell? We all know that cells are the basic units of, of life. For us to survive, for us to live, for a human being to exist, we are all made up of millions of, of cells. And then if we look inside our cells, we have different organelles. So what are those organelles that I'm going to put emphasis on? It is namely the ribosome the cytoplasm as well as what we call the engine of the cell which is the nucleus let us name them again the ribosome the cytoplasm as well as the nucleus the ribosome we know that outside the nucleus we have what we call the endoplasmic reticulum which can either exist as rough as well as smooth when the endoplasmic reticulum is rough we know that it contains ribosomes but then we're going to focus more on ribosomes when we are dealing with RNA. Then secondly, we have the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm, again, we know it is the, a place inside the cell that allows organelles to, to exist. To exist sorry. And then lastly, we have the, the nucleus. Normally when we teach or when we put emphasis on the nucleus, we say that the nucleus is the engine of the cell. You know a car cannot move without an engine. So basically, the nucleus is what controls all the functioning of, uh, of the other parts of, or of the organelles of the cell. So let us look deep inside the, the nucleus, meaning let us go inside the, the nucleus and check what we find inside the, the nucleus. Firstly, inside the nucleus, we have what we call the nucleolus. Yeah. The nucleolus is the dark body that we get inside the nucleus. Then secondly, we have a tangled network that we call the chromatin network. And then the fluid that we get inside the nucleus is what we call the nucleoplasm. So we have the cytoplasm inside the cell, then we have the nucleoplasm inside the, the nucleus. And then we say that, let us put emphasis on the on the, what, sorry, what, what do you call this? On the chromatin network. We say that n the chromatin network contains well, the deoxyribonucleic acid. In short, it, con it contains what we call DNA. I'm sure before you got into depth uh, with this topic with your teachers, you, you first heard or you were familiar with DNA in terms of saying if you want to check the paternity whether a particular father or a particular male is your father or not you go for paternity testing in order to check uh, for crime scenes at crime at crime scenes uh, they're looking for for dna but basically where do we find this this dna so we say firstly we find dna inside the nucleus where in the nucleus do we find dna we say we find it attached on the chromatin network. So what have you just done now? We have looked at the location of DNA. And then secondly, we find DNA at the mitochondria. Remember inside the cell, we have an organelle that provides energy to the cell. What do we call that organelle? Take your minds back, grade 9. We say that organelle is the mitochondrion. So, one mitochondrion, many it is mitochondria. So, again, 
we can find the deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA, we can find it at the mitochondria. So we have two places where DNA is found. The first one, we can find DNA in the nucleus. The second one, we can find DNA in mitochondria. So we now looked at uh, the location of, of DNA. So what really makes up DNA? What is this DNA? Can we see DNA with our uh, naked eyes? We say DNA is microscopic, meaning we cannot see it with our naked eyes. But we have to understand what makes up the DNA. So we have what we call monomers. Monomers are the building blocks of DNA. So, you know, uh, when we're talking about building blocks, we are saying when we're having a lot of, uh, uh, what is this? A lot of bricks combined with cement and sand, we can have, uh, we can have, a, we can have a wall, or we can have a structure, or we can have a building. But as we are looking at that building, we know that that building is made up of bricks. It is made up of sand, of cement, we, uh, of all those uh, building materials that you can think of. So monomers or nucleotides are what we call the building blocks of DNA. So for us to have DNA or for us to see DNA as a nucleic acid, we first have to understand or we first have to be familiar with the nucleotides. What are those nucleotides that make up DNA? We have three components that, uh, that make up a DNA nucleotide. The first one are nitrogenous bases. The second one a phosphate group and then the last one it is a phosphate group sorry a, 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 a deoxyribose sugar so it is three components the first one nitrogenous bases the second one a deoxyribose sugar and lastly we have a phosphate groups group sorry those are what we refer to as monomers as nucleotides the building blocks of of dna let us go back where do we find DNA? We find DNA inside the nucleus of the cell. And DNA consists of what? It consists, it is a nucleic acid number one that consists of nucleotides. How many nucleotides do we have? We have two types of nucleotides, DNA as well as RNA. But for today, we are only focusing on, on DNA. So one might ask, ma'am, you say that DNA is microscopic, meaning no one can see it with a, with a naked eye. How was it that scientists were able to discover the structure of, of DNA? That would be a very vital or very important question in this case, because one wants to know who actually discovered. We know that who discovered light, who discovered sound. We know uh, the theories of Isaac Newton. So we also want to know who actually discovered that DNA has nucleotides. And secondly, the shape of DNA, we say it is double helix. So we want to know who actually saw that this microscopic structure is double helix and number two, it consists of nucleotides. So firstly, we look at the history of, of DNA. When we look at the history of DNA, we say that DNA was basically discovered by two scientists. The, the structure of DNA was basically discovered by two scientists, which was Rosalind Franklin as well as Maurice Wilkins. These two Okay, we all know Rosalind Franklin was a female. You know most females, we're always on top of things. <laughs> so we say that Rosalind Franklin and her assistant, Maurice Wilkins, they researched the structure of DNA. How did they do so? They used X-ray refraction or diffraction images. And then later on, um, Maurice went behind Franklin, the lady, meaning uh, Maurice is a male, he went behind uh, Rosalind Franklin in order to say or to work with other people. Those people were Watson and, and Crick. So what did Franklin do or what did Maurice do? Maurice then took the samples or the images that were obtained by Rosalind Franklin and 
he presented them to Watson and and Creek. Unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin died, and therefore Maurice Wilkins as well as Maurice Watson as well as Creek they received the Nobel Peace Prize for discovering the structure of of DNA. So wow, now we know today when the question paper comes, who discovered the structure of DNA? Because uh, Watson and Creek uh, and Creek received the Nobel Peace Prize, they are listed as the founders or the discoverers of the structure of of DNA. How is DNA structured? What is it that they really discovered? These two scientists, they discovered that DNA is double helix. Immediately you hear the word double, you think of what? You think of two. And then helix, you know a helical shape. We say it is a twisted shape whereby the two strands of DNA are twisted around one another. I forgot that I'm on radio. I'm already demonstrating now how <laughs> how a twist looks like. <laughs> so we say that a, um, a helical shape, it's a shape that is twisted. And in this case, it is a double helix, meaning the two strands of DNA are helically or they are twisted around one another. So every time how wanna uh, when you see a person having twist, when you see a twisted structure, what do you think of? You are going to think of DNA. And then remember, on that twisted on or, or on that helical structure, you are going to think of two strands that are twisted to one another or that are helic and uh, that are that are in a helical shape containing one or containing many of what we call the nucleotides. Remember what I said, for us to have a complete structure or molecule of DNA, there should be what we call monomers of DNA, which are the nucleotides. Remember, I say nucleotides are made up of three components, nitrogenous bases, phosphate group, as well as say deoxyribose sugar. Let us do them again, nitrogenous bases, phosphate group, as well as uh, deoxyribose sugar. What is the natural shape of DNA? Normally this question, you, you find it on the um, one word item question. A natural structure of DNA, we say DNA is double helix. Ma'am, tell us again, what is meant by double helix? Double helix means that the shape of DNA consists of two strands joined together and twisted spirally you get it again these are, it is not only one spiral but it is two strands that are twisted spirally that is what we call a double helix so let us go to the nitrogenous basis remember nitrogenous bases are one of the components that make up um the nucleotides again please do not forget this nucleotides nitrogenous base phosphate group as well as a sugar molecule so we say a phosphate group you always find it attached to a deoxyribose sugar good people it is not just any sugar that you buy crystal hewlett or what do you call it these decastro and whatnot this is a sugar molecule that we find and in, in that we find making up um making up the structure of dna what do we call this sugar we don't just call it a sugar molecule molecule sorry we call it a deoxyribose sugar you can take your minds back and say this word deoxyribose it was derived from the word deoxyribonucleic acid meaning it was derived from it was derived from the a, a term of DNA. So a deoxyribose sugar can only be found in the structure of DNA. And then the last uh, part of the monomer is what we call the nitrogenous base. So when you look at the structure of DNA, what are you going to see? Number one, you're going to see a double helix, meaning a molecule with two strands. After that, what are you going to see? You are going to see on each strand, 
you are going to see nucleotides. Take note of that. It is not nucleotide, meaning it is it is not one. It is many nucleotides. Therefore, uh, we refer to them as nucleotides to show that there is not only one nucleotide, but there are many nucleotides. A phosphate group, a deoxyribose sugar, and then lastly we have a nitrogenous base. What are those nitrogenous bases? We say that DNA consists of four nitrogenous bases. Number one, we have what we call RNA, normally denoted by a capital letter A. RNA, RNA, the way you pronounce it doesn't matter, but how you write it really, really plays an important role. RNA, thymine, denoted by a capital letter C, cytosine, as well as guanine. I know some will, refer, will uh, pronounce it like guanine, adenine, cytosine, thymine, as well as, um, uh, uh, what is this, guanine. But what is important is how we write it. So it is adenine, denoted by a capital letter A, thymine, denoted by a capital letter T, cytosine, denoted by a capital letter C, and then guanine, denoted by a capital letter G. So these nitrogenous bases that I've just mentioned now are complementary, meaning all four of them, they have partners. You know when something is complementary, it, when, when, when someone says, who, you and your partner, you complement one another. No, it means the colors that complement one another, the colors that you are wearing are complementing one another, meaning these colors, they match. Ne, they go well, uh, well. Uh, they go well with one another. So when we say nitrogenous spaces are complementary, we mean that they are always joined together. Which nitrogenous spaces are complementary to one another? Firstly, we have adenine. Adenine, capital letter A. Adenine will always be complemented by thymine. Thymine, capital letter T. So every time when you see R9, you know that R9 has been paired with what? It has been paired with thymine. Then the second pair, we have guanine, always being complemented by cytosine. So every time you see G, you will always see C. Did you get that? Every time you see C, you will always get G. So, every time you see A, it will always be with T. A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, C for cytosine. Note that this pairing of bases means that the two strands of DNA are joined together. Good people, listen. I am telling you, or I am teaching you, I am revising with you that DNA has two strands. On each strand of DNA, we find nucleotides. Ne? And then remember, these strands of DNA are twisted spirally around one another. Why, ma'am? Because DNA naturally has a helical shape. So, on one strand, we'll find a nucleotide. That nucleotide will contain what? It will contain RNA. Sorry, that nucleotide will contain what? It will contain a phosphate group that will be joined to what? To a deoxyribose sugar. And the deoxyribose sugar will always be joined to the nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base can either be RNA or it can be thiamine. It can either be guanine or it can be cytosine. And then, let us make an example. Let's say the first nucleotide, meaning the one that we get on top of a DNA strand, on strand number one. I think we know that DNA has two strands. Two strands, sorry. On strand number one, we have a nucleotide that contains a phosphate group, a deoxyribose sugar, as well as a nitrogenous base. Let us give this nitrogenous base a name. Let's say and the nitrogenous base on strand one is adenine we go to strand number two remember what we said we say that these nitrogenous bases 
are complementary to one another. So, if we have R9 on strand number one, on strand number two, there on the first nucleotide, which nitrogenous base are we going to get? We are going to get thymine. Why thymine? Because all the time, R9 always complements or is complemented by thymine. So, following the nucleotide that has R9, let's say the second nucleotide on the first strand, on the first strand, on the first strand, it's um, cytosine. On the second strand, just below thymine, what are we going to get? We are going to get guanine. Why guanine? Because all the time we say that these nitrogenous bases are complementary to one another. Arenine pairs with thymine. Thymine pairs with arenine. Guanine pairs with cytosine. Cytosine pairs with guanine. Do you get it? So this pairing of nitrogenous bases tells us something. It tells us that um, the two strands of DNA are joined together. So when are the connection between these two strands? Because we say arenine joins with thymine. No? Guanine joins with cytosine. And when we have arenine on the one strand, we'll have thymine on the other strand. What makes sure or what ensures that there is a bond between these two nitrogenous bases or between nitrogenous bases? We call the bond between nitrogenous bases, we refer to it as the weak hydrogen bond. Now we are uh, incorporating physical sciences in terms of bonding. We say that the weak hydrogen bond, we get it between the nitrogenous bases and these bonds are basically what will allow the two strands to be bind to one another. So note, the DNA or the pairing of bases means what? It means that the two strands of DNA are joined together and then they will form a long ladder-like structure. The nitrogenous bases are held together by what? By weak hydrogen bonds. The double ladder-like structure will then become coiled together and it will uh, have a shape that we call a double helix. And then we know that the DNA strands will then wind around proteins that we call the histones. Good people, let us quickly recap on the structure of DNA. Firstly, we say that DNA has a natural shape of double helix. What is double helix again? Double helix means that the structure of DNA has two strands and they are joined together and they are twisted spirally. Number two, DNA is made up of nucleotides or monomers. Monomers are the building blocks. DNA is made up of many monomers that we call nucleotides. What makes up a simple nucleotide? A phosphate group. Could people note when I when I when I emphasize the structure of a nucleotide, I say a phosphate group that is joined to a deoxyribose sugar, a deoxyribose sugar that will be joined to a nitrogenous basis. Uh, normally in paper two, remember we find that, sorry, I forgot to mention this, DNA is assessed in paper two, 27 marks, uh, both uh, preparatory as well as the final examination. So in paper two, one of the questions that may arise is that uh, they will give you a structure that will show a simple nucleotide and then they will have structure of part one two and three let me tell you that parts that we are referring to are the nucleotide uh, is a nucleotide then they ask you what is part one and part two and then part three already they have named it to you they say that part three is adenine so they ask you what is part number two how will you know whether part number two is a phosphate group or it is a deoxyribose sugar a part of a nucleotide that is joined or connected to a nitrogenous base is always a deoxyribose sugar let me repeat it 
a part of a nucleotide that is always bound to a nitrogenous base, meaning to either arenine, guanine, thiamine, or cytosine. We always say it is a deoxyribose sugar. So deoxyribose sugar, we'll get it in the center. It will be bind to both the phosphate group as well as the nitrogenous space. We don't get an instance. Sorry. We don't get an instance whereby a phosphate group is bound to a nitrogenous space. But when we look at the structure of DNA, always it's a phosphate group joined to a joined to a deoxyribose sugar, then joined to a nitrogenous base. So we are fine with that one. Structure of DNA. Number one, the shape of DNA, it is double helical. DNA is made up of nucleotides. How many nucleotides? Many nucleotides. Why many nucleotides, ma'am? Because DNA is a long molecule. It is not a short molecule, but we say DNA is a long molecule. Where do we find DNA? Ma'am, in, in the nucleus of the cell, in every nucleus of the cell, we get, the, we get DNA. How many cells do you have in your body? We have trillion and zillion cells. Meaning, all, if not most, if not all your cells contain what? It contains the same DNA. Most, if not all your cells, in fact, all your cells contain the same DNA. You can name it, whether it's the skin cells, whether it's the hair cells, whether it's your blood cells, whether it's the, the what is this, the, the sweat cells, the, the cells that come from, the cells that come from your, the, your sweat, all the DNA from your body is the same. Are you with me? So we say that that is how we uh, uh, explain or that is how we uh, uh, perplex the structure of DNA. So now that we know how does DNA look like and we also know where, we, where do we find DNA and then lastly we say um, how is, sorry, how does DNA look like? We, we, we now want to know what is the role of DNA? Why should we have DNA? Firstly, DNA carries hereditary information. What is hereditary information? Hereditary information is information that we say uh, contained or that we inherit from our parents. And then this information is being carried in the form of, of genes. And then what are genes? Genes are short sections of DNA. So no more the oh you have your mother's genes, you have your father's genes. What are they actually saying? They're saying at uh, that particular characteristic that they say looks like uh, you look like your mother, you look you look like la your father. They're actually referring to their DNA or they're actually referring to, to DNA. So we say the genes or DNA will determine or the genes will determine the physical characteristics such as the blood group the gene that will be linked to breast cancer the gene that will be linked to the sex uh, linked diseases and so forth as well as the behavior i think we all know uh, especially us from the african society they would normally say yeah go oh, this stubbornness of yours you can see for you inherited from your father's side hey from our family it's mothers at the time from our family, there is no one as stubborn as you. So even behavioral, uh, uh, what is this? The behavior of an organism uh, also is inherited via via DNA. So and again, whether an organism can be tamed or whether it can be domesticated, that can be determined by by DNA. So we say most of the DNA strands do not code for anything. So those DNA strands that do not code for anything, we refer to them as non-coding DNA. 
And then we know the functions of non-coding DNA is basically not for hereditary, but it is to control the functioning of the cells, to control or to regulate the functioning of the genes, and it is to pass on hereditary characteristics. But as to what is the function or what are the two main functions of DNA, familiarize yourselves with the, with the exam guideline. It clearly stipulates the sections of DNA forming they carry what they carry hereditary information meaning that is coded gene coding dna the second function we say that dna contains coded information for protein synthesis we elaborate more on protein synthesis when we do uh, what is this when we do rna and then we say that there are two there is a process that occurs in dna Akira, I mentioned earlier that the DNA that we have is basically inherited. So when you take your DNA, we say that this DNA is identical to your 50% to your mother's DNA and 50% to your father's DNA. So if you are a male, by the time you, you start, uh, what is this, reproduction, 50% of your DNA will be passed on to your children as well. The other 50% will come from your, your, your wife. The same applies. If you are the wife, 50% will be passed on and then the husband will also pass, pass on the remaining 50%. So how does that take place? Or how do we explain the process whereby DNA is kept the same or DNA makes exact copies of, of itself? We call that process DNA replication. What is DNA replication? DNA replication is the process whereby DNA makes exact copies of itself. Good people, when DNA makes exact copies of itself, it means that the DNA looks exactly the same. It does not change. Meaning if the first base started with R9, in the other copy, the first base will still be aranine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and so forth. So how does this process take place? When does it take place? Where does it take place? What is the importance of DNA replication? Firstly, let us answer the when question. When does DNA replication take place? DNA replication takes place in the cell cycle in a process called interface remember the previous topics or topic we looked at meiosis comparing it with mitosis meiosis is a cell division mitosis is a cell division so before the phases of both meiosis and mitosis can take place we say that a very important preparing phase takes place what do we call that phase we call it interface during the events of interface dna replication takes place so when does dna replication take place it takes place during interface of the cell cycle and then number two where in the cell does it take place where does dna so when i know when nene vanir ne. So when does DNA replication take place? It takes place during inter any cell division. Before mitosis can start, before meiosis can start, DNA makes exact copies of itself. Where, hokai, var, where does DNA replication take place? It takes place inside the nucleus. Yes, inside the nucleus, that's where DNA replication takes place. How does DNA replication take place? This is where you score marks. Good people. Uh, in terms of those questions where you gather a lot of marks in life sciences, it's where processes are concerned. Where we have processes, we know that there are marks. We collect marks there. So how this process takes place? We get six to seven marks. Here is how it takes place. Step number one, we write it in point form. Here is how it takes place. Firstly, we say that the double helix DNA unwinds. Do you see what I've just done? 
double helix DNA. So you emphasize on the natural shape of DNA. So we say the double, you, you know, just say double helix unwinds. Double helix of what? The double helix DNA unwinds. When it unwinds, it means that it loses that natural shape of a spiral of or of a twist. It takes the shape of a ladder. You get one mark just for saying the double helix DNA unwinds. Now, and after the double helix has unwound, we say it will have the shape of the ladder. Point number two, we say the weak hydrogen bonds between nitrogenous bases will break. Remember that, remember, between each nitrogenous base, between the two strands of DNA, we have nitrogenous. Between the two strands of DNA, meaning between the nitrogenous bases, we have the weak hydrogen bonds. Hence, we say, after the helical structure or after the DNA has, uh, has unwound, uh, we say the weak hydrogen bonds will break. Uh, if you remember in grade 10, what we call catalysts, couple enzymes. We say enzymes are catalysts because they they speed up a reaction. So in this case, the enzymes are going to help in breaking the weak hydrogen bonds. So notice what will happen. When the weak hydrogen bonds break, this will cause the two strands of DNA to separate. Why separation? Because initially, they were joined together by the weak hydrogen bonds. Now, so when the weak hydrogen bonds break, these two DNA strands are going to separate. When they separate, a we say a complementary strand will form. So, number one, what did we say? Double DNA, double helix DNA unwinds, weak hydrogen bonds break, and then the DNA strands separate. And then we say the two DNA strands will serve as a template. Template, it shows, I tell when we have a template, it shows us how to, how to do things or how, uh, in terms of how should the next strand be like. It will be a reflection or it will be, a, 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 the other strand will be a, a complementary template. Meaning, on the first strand that separated, how is another strand? Hence, we say it serves as a template so that a complementary strand can form. So that DNA strand, yeah, bona for okay, it's a secure one. I can no longer be called a DNA molecule because now I consist of one strand. My partner and I, we divorced. Why did we divorce? Because we want to make more copies or we want to make exact copies of what of ourselves. So what happens? We say a complementary strand comes on board. When it comes on board, how many strands will come on board? Two strands. Why two strands? Because initially we had two strands of DNA. So when these two strands separate, both of them will serve as a template. So strand number one will be a template for template one. And strand number two will also be a template for strand number two. So strand template number one. Template number one, it will complement what is already on strand number one. Meaning, if on strand number one we had arenine, thymine, guanine, guanine, arenine, thymine, guanine, guanine, those are the four first four nitrogenous bases. What will be the first four nitrogenous bases on template number one? For arenine, we'll have what? We'll have thymine. For thymine, we'll have arenine. For guanine, we'll have guanine. For guanine, we'll have guanine. And so forth. Up until the end of that DNA molecule, we will have complementary bases. So I have just explained that step. Whether we say the two DNA strands will serve as a template to form new strands. Now that the new strands are formed, so notice one thing. We have an old strand or we have a complementary strand and a template. Complementary strand and a template. How many DNA molecules do we have now? We have four strands. Four strands give us how many DNA molecules? It gives us two DNA molecules. So we say after the DNA strands 
have served as templates using free floating neutral using free floating dna nucleotides from the nucleoplasm the, D, the templates or the new dna strands will be complementary to the original strand mamela these nitrogenous bases that i've just mentioned they don't just get stolen from somewhere but they are free floating inside what inside the nucleoplasm so they will get attached if strand number one like i said it was adenine hopefully i am on which a uh, nucleotide will go to them uh, 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 to the template to the template it will be a nucleotide with nitrogenous base thiamine where do we get these nitrogenous bases using free floating nucleotides so nucleotide is a set containing what phosphate a, a deoxyribose sugar as well as a nitrogenous base so we say at the end two strands mm -mm, two molecules of dna will be formed and we say this process is controlled by enzymes so notice we get marks way the first mark dna double helix dna unwinds weak hydrogen bonds break and two dna strands separate so we say the two each strand will serve as a template to form what to form complementary bases using what using free floating nucleotides from the nucleoplasm the new strands will become complementary to the original strand and two new or two copies of dna molecules will be formed so we say if we look at the new strands mm -mm, and the new molecules of dna that are formed they will be exactly the same like the original one what do we call that process we call that process dna replication and then the last question is what is the importance of dna replication we say that dna replication takes place to ensure that the new cells that are formed have the same information as the mother cells meaning how can a mother cell i'm not actually saying the cells from the mother but i'm basically saying the cells from the original dna those are what we refer to as the mother cell so the purpose of dna replication it is to the purpose of dna replication it is to make sure that the new cells that are formed have the same dna as the original cell take it with mitosis take it with meiosis at the end of meiosis we form gametes those are cells and then we say the gametes they have the same dna as the owner of <laughs> of those cells so if, if if it is the mother the ovum will have the same dna as the mother if it is the father the sperm cell will have the same o will have the same dna because why because dna replication has taken place and then the last part that i'm looking at for five minutes <laughs> it will be dna profiling normally i go back to the example that i mentioned earlier yeah, okay. Honey, when we first learned or knew about DNA, it is whether we are looking at the paternity, sorry, proving of paternity, solving of crimes, and so forth. Hey, let us go and test for, for DNA. Yeah, we're going to check DNA if it is the father. What exactly are they compiling them? They are compiling what we call a DNA profile. A DNA profile is what we call the barcode meaning it is dna that has been extracted and that has been put in a in a barcode pattern or in an x-ray film so we say this dna pattern will contain of lines that are thick sometimes it will have thin lines it will differ in lenses and it will also differ in the the positions so everyone has a unique dna except for identical twins myself and sweetie we are identical so no one knows who's who it might be now it is sweetie presenting not me <laughs> but because we look so alike <laughs> so you want to know who's who 
even if you could check my dna profile and her dna profile you will see it is ex it is exactly the same so everyone has a unique dna except what except for identical twins ma'am when when do they need a dna profile on another time when we were talking about proving of paternity and all that that is when they pro that when they uh, uh, combine a dna profile to identify crime suspects normally there will be a crime done and then when that crime is committed you will see for uh, the the perpetrators will have left maybe a strand of hair a drop of blood we know uh, in such samples we are going to find what dna secondly a dna profiling can be used to prove paternity not only paternity even maternity ne. thirdly determining the probability of cases in genetic defects establishing of compatibility tissue for organ transplants and lastly in identifying uh, relatives those are the uses of dna profiling so sometimes uh, society differs what well, some people would say it is unnecessary to call to call, what is this to conduct a dna profile some would say no let us do a, a dna profile why because the, the the results can be tempered with you know someone who knows someone who knows someone even uh, the perpetrators when they go to a crime scene if they want to frame you they already go with that particular sample maybe they have a strand of your hair they plant that strand of hair so when the forensic uh, aspects come they take the sample of hair that was found and then they trace it they have a suspect oh meaning Pule is the one who who committed the crime only to find that at that time of the crime Pule was with Memusia in studio so you, also, you always have to have what an alibi so that is why sometimes DNA profiling is is rejected good people that is how I want to wrap up and also take take uh, uh, questions what have we learned today we have learned what is DNA where is DNA found what is how does DNA look like and the process of DNA replication who discovered D, the structure of DNA as well as what we call DNA profiling so Pule, that is how I want to wrap up and take questions for the next five minutes thank you so much <laughs> in an animal cell where dna is found dna is found in the mitochondria as well as in the nucleus okay good afternoon Memusia. this is kopano kwaho from virginia my question is how does nuclear dna control the pro the synthesis of proteins wow Kobano is such a bright child hey <laughs> oh you know i don't but then judging by the question that he okay. just asked basically what one of the functions that i mentioned okay. so Kopano, in terms of how does nuclear dna remember nuclear d aptipule is dna that we find inside us so how it controls protein synthesis protein synthesis is a process a. so for rna to be formed Kopano, it requires the information of what of nuclear dna so how it controls the process is basically to allow the formation of what you call mrna or messenger rna we would really come on we would really zero seven two eight three nine zero four two seven come to the m in the assessing okay with the port of them see ya as an alting a corner move with a fellow what's up okay now for now on zero seven two eight three nine zero four two seven nine seven eight 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 those are nitrogenous bases mm. ne? so these forensic people or these scientists sorry let me just go to these scientists bo wilkins and bo kriki bo morris and and so forth sorry rosalind those are the people that discovered her well, dna is actually double helix and on those strands these are actually what we find guanine pairing with cytosine cytosine pairing with guanine adenine thermine thermine guanine 
So without those nitrogenous bases, hakuna DNA. So oh. our DNA is fully dependent on those, or it is fully uh, 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 built by those nitrogenous bases. Oh, you clearly want to meet two, three minutes before six o'clock. I can't remember. Can't feel like I'm just doing a matter of repeating. 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 Repeating.